I had this theory that our level of emotional intelligence and our level of creative intelligence dictate our level of leadership intelligence. And so since I had been working and training leaders, I knew that this would be a really impactful message. And so that's how I like decided to put that all together. Hi, and welcome to the Micro Empires Podcast, where we learn how to build small empires for wealth and security, because you don't have to be wealthy to build wealth. I'm Jennifer Grimson. I'm your host. Let's get started. On today's show, I'm following up with Beth English. Beth is an artist and a speaker and a content creator and a friend of mine and somebody who I got to know professionally first, and then we became friends, and she's had an incredible transformation. If you haven't heard her episode from last year, please go back and listen to it. It's called Turning Fear into Joy, and it is the most downloaded episode of all of the episodes that I have, and people are downloading that show daily to this day, even a year after. I'm not sure if it's the title that strikes home. I'm not sure what it is, but Beth really shared where she was and what was happening in her life and was really honest about it. So I wanted to follow up with her today in about what she's done in the last year and how she has created, totally pivoted and created a whole new line of work for her business. And it's been really incredible. And it was through a process that I witnessed. Certainly she did all the hard work, but I was coaching her along the way with regards to things like taking stock, et cetera, things like that. But she is a great student because when she has something, she grabs onto it and she uses that resource the entire time. So all the sales tools that I taught her, all that stuff, now it's second nature to her. So it was really great to follow up with her and what she has built and her business. And I hope you enjoy the show and let me know what you think. Let's do it. (laughs) So thanks for being here. You're awesome. You'll keep us up to date on Facebook Live and let us know if anybody has any questions. But if you're watching this later, shoot your questions in the comments and we will get back to you. This is a first time ever. So we don't know what's going to happen and what's going to be good and what's going to be bad. But Beth, I'm going to give the audience, first of all, if you have not listened to Beth's first episode, I will include it in the comments. I'll put a link in there. So please listen to that first. But last year, I probably interviewed you in June, might've been June or July, and you had made a move to Texas, but we talked about how you and I came together for some sales coaching. And then when COVID hit, everything had to change and you made some radical steps to preserve yourself really, because you look, I remember having the conversation with you in April and saying, well, gosh, they say we might be in quarantine till August. Little did we know it would be a year. So you did some really smart moves by getting out of your rent and getting out of where you were and finding a much more affordable and supportive place for you to continue to build in that time. So I think we covered all that in the first episode, what got you down there and what you were working on. And I've been in touch with you the entire time and I've seen all of the work that you've done. But even for me, watching from the outside, knowing how hard you've worked, it didn't even click with me until very recently. Like when I saw you the other day that all of these pieces have come together. And because when I met you and you said, well, I'm an artist and I'm a speaker and I want to blend the two. And my thought is always, well, who are you going to sell that to? And who, who can you bring that to? And who can't you bring that to? But that's a really hard barrier to break. So I don't want to go on too long, but maybe pick up from where we left off last summer. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I remember last summer. I know we both were feeling a whirlwind of emotions. Mm-hmm. We really leaned on each other. I think during that time of uncertainty to help one another make decisions, try to see the future more clearly, give advice. And it was extremely helpful. I mean, you helped me to make some big changes that I knew had been on the horizon for a while, but you never make that leap until you're brought to the edge of the cliff, you know, and that's where we were standing. It's like, I had created this really great product where I was facilitating groups, nonprofit groups, corporate groups, 
into a creative experience where they were able to connect with themselves. They were able to communicate, build community. Maybe we had a creative project. It was really meant to just create a lot of connection, community with the outcome as being like creative thinking. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was doing before COVID. And after that was shut down, I was like, well, what am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I knew for my mental health, it was important that I was not isolated and alone in my apartment for a year. So I took your advice. I took all these steps to get out of my lease, to move. I moved across, you know, two states, I guess three states, I don't know, a thousand miles. And I couldn't have done it without you being like speaking some just normal wisdom, like just stuff I wasn't even focused on because I think at that time it was hard to know exactly the next right step and the next right step. You know, I told, I remember telling you, I'm afraid to drive a thousand miles without a place to sleep because that's too long for me to be in the car. And I know I can't do that. And you were like, well, just get an Airbnb, Beth. It's like not a big deal. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Oh, right, 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 right. Sometimes the things that seem so complicated to us, someone from the outside could be looking in and simplify it so much. And I think that's what you did for me. Like you were looking at my life, knowing me professionally first, personally next, looking in and then giving me some just really simple, actionable advice that I took to do a lot of different things besides just move, just like put myself in a new situation, but also thinking about what am I going to do with this product that I had created? What am I going to do next with, you know, financially, what am I going to focus on and, and work towards to build? And I mean, if I hadn't had you just sort of like lighting that fire under me to say, what are you going to do next? Like make a decision, go for it, go. I'm like, I don't know, like, oh, so I did the next best thing, Mm -hmm. invested in myself. I, you know, signed up for coaching. I got into some programs online. I basically, sorry, I want to, I want to interrupt you before you get into that because yeah, those steps I think are really important and they're hard to do. They're hard to do for anybody, but you had things standing in your way that many people have standing in their way. So unresolved issues from long ago, some personal financial issues from long mm-hmm. ago that seemed insurmountable. But once we started, you know, I call it opening the mail. Once we start just literally opening the mail and being like, okay, it's not insurmountable. There's a number. And then you did all the hard work though, because remember there there was a long list of things. And I just want to talk about the practicalities, if you don't mind a little bit, rebuilding your credit score, getting debt paid off that you owed, also being paid money that you were owed and why you hadn't required that. And for many of us, it's kind of like, well, I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to be the squeaky wheel, or I don't want to be any of those things. And you were all those things. Taking advantage of the opportunities that were at your feet because of COVID, if you took advantage of unemployment and the loans and everything that was there, it could stabilize most people and uphold you. And that was work too, just getting that figured out. And do I qualify? Do I have a right to this? I don't want to feel bad about it, all that stuff. So I just am very proud of you because it was, yeah, we opened the mail together, but then you started making phone calls. You started negotiating with people about your debt. You started hammering down on what you were owed. And by golly, you got yourself a big old nut. (laughs) You put yourself in a safe place where it was much less expensive for you to live. And you got yourself a big old nut. And then you thought, all right, I already have this great program that I can't do in person right now. What am I going to do? So then, so tell us, tell us there. So I basically went back to school. I've been in group coaching programs, multiple ones for almost a year now. And so I'm a totally different person. I have put myself through a learning experience that has broadened my horizons, has shown me what's possible, has shown me you know, everything that I need to know to level up, to do what's next for me. I think oftentimes we don't give ourselves permission enough to change. Mm -hmm. And 
this was me giving myself permission to change. Number one, I wasn't leading a monthly event for a group of people on the National Creative Group. I wasn't doing that anymore because I, I was in Texas. It was COVID, whatever. So that's different. Well, how am I going to lead this community? How am I going to lead professionally? I was speaking. My speaking gigs were canceled, but I could have pivoted into virtual much faster than I had done, which I have now pivoted into virtual keynote speaking. So that's been great. And just took time. And so step by step by step, I just kept putting myself in situations where I was going to learn and I was going to grow. And Mm -hmm. I was going to do that in a way that felt balanced. And that felt like I was connecting to my mission in life, the purpose I had set out for, and just keep realigning all of my actions back to like my North Star. You know, it's sometimes you get lost right along the way like oftentimes entrepreneurs anyone who creates something brand new from nothing you do that for a year or so you get lost yeah. you get you know thrown off your initial path because then this is what happens and you hear a lot of times people talk about airplanes like they're never on their flight trajectory they're always just trying to stay back on it and so if you think about your life or your career as just trying to stay back on that trajectory Like it just gives you a lot of hope to know that like all you have to do is just keep taking the steps forward, trying to stay on the path. And then eventually you're going to end up in a new place. And like, that's where I am now. Like literally I'm in a new place, (laughs) but also emotionally, professionally, personally, like I'm not the same person I was when I left. And I'm so happy for that because going to Texas really helped me. I mean, I know I've always been about like overcome your or turn your fear into joy. Like that was sort of my tagline for many years. And a lot of it, you know, is simply because I was in a lot of fear. I did the work and I turned it into joy because I went through trauma recovery, which, you know, anyone who's been through trauma knows the kind of fear that you carry with you every single day. So I'd done that, but like what I hadn't done was go back to myself, like who I am at my core. Right. I had found joy, right? But like, had I really found peace? I don't know until like this last year, I really found myself in a place of peace and a place of clarity Yeah, where I could see my life in the future and what I wanted and what I didn't want, especially knowing what I don't want. So now that I'm back in Nashville, I'm really clear about that. And I think that we all needed that clarity. Many of us are, we have an opportunity to go back in the world, but we don't want to. <laughs> like, right. We like the idea of staying at home with the option of going out, right? So, right. Yeah. I like to walk through steps. So, from the outside looking in, I just want to make, if anybody's tracking along, kind of like, okay, because I think that's one of the hardest things. People tell their stories about how they turn things around and they don't get granular enough. Mm-hmm. But you dove in to a whole new way, which you were going to have to learn from scratch, yeah. which is basically making this environment available online also in person when that, you know, becomes available, but different offerings. And it was an expense, a significant expense that was Mm going to take everything that you just worked for to pull together. Mm -hmm. And you and I have been having conversations and I was like, Oh, can't we buy you some real estate? I really want you to buy some real estate, but this was your path and you needed to learn the skill. You went back to school. You're still in school, right? And you're becoming more of a master, but you went through several months of just head down, learning, hard learning in your little space, you know, and that's another thing. You're not surrounded by students. I mean, I know you have a support group and all that stuff, but it's not like people get what you're doing. I didn't necessarily get what you were doing either. (laughs) I I didn't know what I was doing. Right. But you worked hard and you committed. And that's something that you always do. I, I noticed that about you in the speaker lab and anything else that you've signed up for or belong to. Like you use every single resource that you have, myself included. So you learned, not only learned a new skill, because it wasn't just about a skill, you had to create something, which is incredibly hard. Yeah. And you incorporated into that in the back of your head, all of the sales skills that you've been picking up. And now you're becoming a little sales ninja and I can't believe it. I'm so proud of you. But another big turning point was you taking stock again, which we always have to take stock. I recently had a personal issue and maybe I'll talk about that in a little solo you know, minute, but I'm completely freaking out because my money culture is still based in fear. And I have to take stock. So you took stock again and took a hard look around at other things you had created and didn't realize what you were sitting on. So maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, look, 
I have been coaching for like over five years. I have been teaching the same things for a long time. Like I know what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to just set the bar here. Like I am a professional at what I do. But when I got into this program, it shook me up. It was like a snow globe. You just shook up. And what I realized is that number one, my messaging was not clear enough. And my program, my frameworks were not like tight enough. My offer was not compelling enough. So I have been working at getting my messaging right, getting my positioning right. I mean, all these things that anyone who puts out a product has to go through. And that doesn't mean that you get it right the first time. It means like, I I screwed up big time Mm -hmm. my my first go at this. Like big time to the point where I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. You know, you start to seriously question yourself, but then you just pick yourself back up and you just keep going. And then, man, now I feel like I am getting so much better at this. I am learning so much new information that I can apply to everything that I do in my business that it's just unbelievable. And so, I have just been going through the motions of figuring that out, of tightening it up, of getting the package just right. And now, you know, I've been doing this. I created this keynote, a signature keynote, because I knew I needed, you know, 45 minutes to just kind of share everything that I know, all of my frameworks that I have. I put everything that I've written over the last three to four years for different clients and smashed it into one awesome keynote. And people are going crazy for it. I just booked another gig for it and it's huge. Like the feedback is incredible. The presentation is beautiful. Like I don't even believe that this is me right now. Right. (laughs) Right. And so, yeah, it's just all has been working to get put together events, you know, into this final product that I have and, and we'll be doing more of. So So that's interesting. I want to talk about the sales side of it because that's hard for everybody. Any entrepreneur or, you know, just solopreneur, whatever you want to call it, who's out there, the hardest, hardest thing for anybody in business is sales. I mean, you've got to sell. So you pulled together several things. Number one, you shifted. Yes, you learned how to create courseware, et cetera, and that's going to happen. But you never left alone the keynote, which, as we all know, after now being well over a year in COVID, keynote speeches on Zoom are boring and it's really hard to stay engaged. I've done some speaking in conferences. I was honored to be invited, but I'm looking at myself going, man, if they're not asleep, I don't know why, because it's just really hard. It's hard to get anybody engaged or interested in what you're talking about Mm -hmm. and watching you. But you have like, I see all of these parts of you that came together. So number one, early on, we started working on before COVID, how you were going to sell. And you had created a speaker series, a keynote speech, and from sources that probably seemed like it was reasonable. You were calling into bureaus and conference leaders and HR managers and et cetera, et cetera. And what I really worked with you on was, hang on, there's probably a lot more, we call it low hanging fruit. There's probably Mm -hmm. a lot of fruit just hanging really close to you. You don't have to go that far. Let's start with your network right now. Mm -hmm. And, And again, we go back to assessing who has paid you in the past to do what you did. Okay. So let's say Bob paid you in the past to do what you did. Let's go back to Bob and see if he needs more. Let's go back to Bob and see if he has five more Bobs who need the same thing. Mm -hmm. What does Bob look like? (laughs) Let's find a bunch more Bobs and let's hit them up. And so you became, I taught you that on LinkedIn and you just became a ninja at it, but it took some time. It took some handholding of like, how do I write to this person? What do I say? And now I see you do it as second nature. Anytime you have an opportunity, the first thing I say is, have you connected on LinkedIn? And you're like, yep, already done. Or you do it while you're on the phone. Like you're not shy anymore. You're just doing it. So that was incredible. And then you took a look at another low hanging fruit that you had, which was the Nashville creative group, which is Mm -hmm. a phenomenal group here that you developed. So tell us about that group that I'm a part of. And I love by the way. Well, it's a great community. You know, people love it because 
they can be themselves there. They can be welcomed with open arms and encouraged and supported. Like there's very little riffraff going around in that community. I think people really like it so much that they protect it. They look out for it. So I'm thankful for those people who do that. But it's this group that I had been leading for a long time and I've been hosting these events for them. And it was wonderful. Like I made some of my best friends through that community. And so it's just a great thing. But I knew for myself, even before COVID, that the model was not sustainable any longer. I had burnt myself out eight years, almost a hundred events all for free. Right. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And now that I look back, I realize me over giving, give, 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 serve, serve, serve. Like that was a trauma response. Mm -hmm. And you devalue your own worth by doing that. Yeah. Me doing that was a trauma response. I had to learn new boundaries. If I was going to show up and lead and serve at the level that I know that I can, Right. I just couldn't do it the same way I was doing before. So now I have a new plan on how to lead them. Like truly, like it's not just a community for artists to come together and share their shows or whatever. Like it's for people who have a mission to do something incredible with their gifts. Right. And they have a vision for art they want to make or a podcast they want to create or videos that they want to produce. I mean, this really is about encouraging people through the creative process by number one, how do we stay creative and and focus and (laughs) just get the work, just get started, period. And so I've outlined some topics that I think are really instrumental to helping creatives thrive. And that is our our woundedness, our own, the way that we see ourselves, the thoughts that we have about ourselves, like limiting beliefs and our confidence. Like these are all the things that if we want to be successful, we really need to have under control in a way where we aren't letting these feelings of self-doubt stop us. We're not letting our low self-esteem to tell us who we are. We are acknowledging our gifts and our power and our message in a way that is going to empower the community to feel like, oh, there's this thing I've been wanting to do, but I haven't done it because I've been afraid. Like I know that my mission in life is to encourage people to create no matter what type of creator that they are, because the last thing that I want to see is someone stopped by fear. Mm -hmm. And by leading this community all of these years, I learned that fear was the number one thing that stopped artists from taking action. Well, if fear is the root, like, Well, what other branches have grown from that, right? And so we have to go back and look and, you know, take a really hard look at the things that we're feeling, the things that we're thinking and how that's impacting the actions that we're taking today. Right. So part of whenever you're starting a podcast or a business or whatever you're doing, people tell you, you you know, what's your avatar? Who are you looking for? Who's your customer? And you're encouraged to niche down, niche down, niche down as small as you can. You know, I provide marketing for plumbers in the 37206 area code who only work on Tuesdays, whatever it is. (laughs) And that's hard to do when you have an idea. I had the same problem where people are like, oh, I have an idea for a podcast. It's for everyone. Well, it can't be for everyone because everyone can't find it. Then it's for no one. Then it's for no one. Exactly right. It just shows your level of expertise. And when you think you're for everyone, that's like the most amateur thing that you could ever say, which is fine. That's where we all start, you know? Right. I agree. (laughs) I agree. So when you niche down, even just in your mind to, I am going to deliver, this message is really impactful and powerful for artists. Mm -hmm. And then developed a really compelling keynote and are now delivering it to universities and corporations, the surprising, maybe not so surprising, one of the surprising responses is, A, they need it. Of course, they do need it. Everybody does. But B, you've even got direct feedback of, this is the first time anybody in the workplace has ever addressed trauma 
in a workshop Mm -hmm. that I can use and how powerful that is. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a little sneaky sneak way to get in there and talk about trauma? (laughs) Yeah. Shoot. That's what I love because I just want to go back. You said, you know, earlier we were talking about sales and how, how is getting into sales more easily, but like you can't sell a bad product. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My initial talks were not what people were really hungry for. Right. I mean, we all want to feel more creative. We all want to be creative. We want our our teams to feel creative, but that wasn't enough, right? Now I have combined emotional wellness with creativity and, and how we perform creatively at work. Mm-hmm. And that was like the magic that I needed to get people to realize that there's a connection between the two. You want to be more creative at work? Well, what's your emotional wellness like, you know? And it's like, people aren't thinking that these two connect, but they do because I had this theory that our level of emotional intelligence and our level of creative intelligence dictate our level of leadership intelligence. And so since I had been working and training leaders, I knew that this would be a really impactful message. And so that's how I like decided to put that all together. Can you say that again? The emotional intelligence walks us through that again, because I got to write that down. (laughs) Our level of emotional intelligence Mm -hmm. and our level of creative intelligence impact our leadership intelligence. Uh, So if you had a graph, mm -hmm. one axis was emotional intelligence, one axis was creative intelligence, at the line in which, where they intersect is your level of leadership intelligence. Your ability to lead. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's really, that is fantastic. Some people may think that podcasting is easy, but it's really not. It's all the back end stuff that someone like me doesn't know anything about that makes it very difficult to have a successful show. So how have I been able to do it? By partnering with Streamline Podcasts. They have made my life so incredibly easy. I get to focus on my great guests and content, and then I deliver the audio to them and they take it from there. They do all of the editing, all the music, all the show notes, all the socials, and they just get to sit back. And within 48 hours, I have all of my content delivered back to me. The best part is they make it really, really affordable. And believe me, I've looked at a lot of different options. So if you're interested in podcasting and want to use this great product, you can contact Streamline Podcasts and use the code MICROEMPIRES, all capitals, all one word, and you will get a discount. Happy podcasting. Now let's get back to the show. So I've watched your latest and I was blown away because it's so, it it is visually beautiful. You have mastered the ability to keep people engaged on a Zoom conference, even when you can't see them or maybe they can't see you. No, yeah, I can't see them. (laughs) You can't see them. So you're just hoping, (laughs) but you've mastered it. Not only your voice and your tone and the stories, but of course the images, you are an artist. So they are all these amazing images, but a lot of the images are you just interacting with people, but they're Mm -hmm. visually interesting. And to see that all come together, to see like, well, of course it looks this beautiful because she's an artist. And of course she's speaking to your emotional intelligence and your creative intelligence because she's a trauma survivor and she teaches that. Mm -hmm. And of course she's talking about leadership because she's led a group for eight years of 10,000 people, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what made me tear up the other day when I saw it, I was like, I'm so proud of you. I said, I'm going to tear up again. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of what you've done. Thank you. You know, don't don't make me ugly cry. I won't. I'm not. (laughs) The, the keynote for me is just like, the tagline is like, it's a keynote that's so engaging. It feels like a workshop because it is like the most fun that I have through coaching is when we actually start doing the work. Like when you were like, Beth, open the mail, like right now on the phone call, like get your calculator out. And I'm like, really? Like right, right now? <laughs> right. We're going to write so that email right now. I exactly. meet people where they're at and I invite them to join me. Right. And so, because I like to have fun, I can have fun all by myself. That's cool. Like I invite people in on that. And all I really need to do is like bring the energy. And so I just try to take really good care of myself so that I can always bring that energy, even on like a virtual. And the whole idea behind the photographs is like, I'm not there with them. I miss that about facilitating. Right. 
but I can at least help them see into my world, see into the experiences that I create for my clients. And then that way they can visualize themselves being in that experience themselves simply by, you know, the use of a great photograph. Thank you, John Partapillo, because Mm -hmm. all of my photographs, because he took them of me. Right. Mm -hmm. And so over all of these years and all of these events, John was there shooting, making sure that I had documentation of the work that I was doing. And now I'm able to use that in my marketing, in all my presentations, you know, in my, in my slides and all of, all of the things that I do. So without that, I would not be presenting myself at the level that I am. And I knew that going into this years ago that I needed someone in my life to these types of photographs. And I feel like I manifested John into my life. I was like, I know I need a great photo- a photographer. Lo and behold, I meet John Partipillo at the Tennessean. We become great friends. And ever since then, he's been right there helping me. I've been right there helping him. We have such a close relationship and it's always meant to empower one another as creatives to support each other because this is a lonely life. But if you have a partner in it, if you have a community in it, if you have just friends who are like you, it makes it so much better. I think that's why we love the creative group because it's just like, you realize you're not alone in this, you know? Like we want to feel like we belong, right? Why not? I mean, we at a deep level want to connect with people. And if we can't do that, we feel like we're going to die. And I think that's what like, what I needed was the creative group in my life. I needed people who were like me. I mean, I spent my whole life not knowing anyone really like me. Right. And that's lonely. Mm -hmm. And now I have like thousands and thousands of people who are like me and like, I only hang out with artists. I only want to be around like super creative and curious people who love life, who want to make things and experiment. And so I, when I meet other people who don't know that exist, I'm like, Hey, you're missing out. Yeah. Come on. Cause this is a great place to be. So, you know, I remember when you and I we're first kind of digging out and trying to see, you know, where could your business go? And I said to you, I can promise you that 99.9% of most high level executives. And when I say high level executives, they could just be salespeople. They could be at a director level, whatever it is. Maybe they're making tons of money. Most of them have no outlet for creativity, believe they don't have any creativity, but I would say, I would say that the majority of them crave it and have no idea where to begin. And that doesn't mean that you have to pick up a paintbrush or anything like that. It could be anything. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I I talked about an event that I went to one night and it was not uncommon to what I experienced myself in the corporate world. You're walking around a room with all these very well-paid, very successful people. And when you ask them, when they ask me, what do you do? And I say, well, I have a podcast and I'm an artist and I'm an investor. They're like, oh my God, you know, and I asked them about what they do and they're like, wah, 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 because they're staying it for three reasons, the money, the money, the money, <sighs> and there's zero fulfillment and not that they need to leave that job. They don't need to leave that job. You know, that's part of it too. It's not like you have to quit your job and get into real estate or something else. You know, that's not necessary, but exploring that if you feel dead every day, nine to five or more, that's no way to live your life. And many, mm-hmm. many people do. So, mm-hmm. and yeah. I want to change that. Mm -hmm. I want to empower people to believe that they can to make a change because I was there too. I mean, I was like, it's been a long road for me. (laughs) Yeah. First, number one, just acknowledging that I had childhood trauma. Number two, what to do when you have to accept it. Like you're not in denial anymore. Number getting into therapy and, and then just like healing slowly, but surely. But that's why I was like early on, I knew I don't care what it takes. I'm going to do whatever I can to go through this process as if I am the art, right? I am creating myself. So I'm going to play with crystals. I'm going to go to energy healers. I'm going to go to church and I'm going to see a therapist and I'm going to eat plant-based and I'm going to exercise and I'm going to dance and I'm going to sing and I'm going to just go out there and open myself up to the world and say, what do you got for me? Because I'm ready to see what's possible. And just through that spirit of curiosity and openness and experimentation, I was able to discover a whole new life for myself. And so what I've done is I've taken all of that work 
distilled it down into these really nice frameworks and processes, leading people step by step by step. And so what I notice is when I start working with a client, it's usually about the first the first month is kind of tough because we're like digging deep and we're going down into the soul. <laughs> and then right. by the end of the second month, their energy has totally changed. They're smiling, they're open. You know, it's like all of this has been through virtual mostly the last year. And I can't tell you the first Zoom call is like shut down. <laughs> and then like after a month or a month and a half or so, it's like, hey, it's like, let's do this. And it's that's all I need. Like that makes me feel so good. You've said a couple of times you're a totally different person than you were a year ago. How are you different? Well, hmm. you know, glad I asked. <laughs> you know, when you're marketing yourself or you're, you know, trying to brand yourself, put yourself in a nice little box with a little logo and a little tagline and hey, this is me. Well, that little box I put myself in was fine, but it really wasn't me. I think thought it's who I needed to be, right? I think that's what we sometimes do. It's not that I was being inauthentic. It was just, I thought, all right, this is the way I'm going to present myself because it's professional or whatever. Well, I'm not really that professional. I am when it comes to emailing, following up and, you know, communication, all that, but like my spirit is wild. Okay. Like when I get to Texas, like I am back home. I am wild. I am in the woods. I am in the water and I'm running around with my bikini on everywhere I go. And I'm just like, this is the life, you know? (laughs) So I definitely got back in touch with my wild feminine power. And yes, that may not work in certain circles, but I don't care. Like I'm going to present myself from who I am. And I think I'm going to attract like the right people. And when it comes to watching a virtual keynote, like you want someone pretty wild and fun out there to be leading you. So I think it's a, I think it's great. Right. I'll give you some feedback. You didn't ask, but I'm giving it to you anyway. (laughs) Uh, One of the things you've done over this year is you've shot a regular series of videos with another artist. And I know you do that on a regular basis. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And that has your camera presence has changed. Yeah. And not that I'm an expert at it, but I went through it too. When I look back at when I started this podcast and anytime there was a video on, I feel like I was a game show host uh-huh. like the entire time. I'm smiling. I'm smiling so hard. I can't even talk. And you know, it's hard to look at yourself in a camera all day long. So you just have to shut that off and just look at the person and let it go. And I remember asking my husband, because he's been on TV, you know, what do you do? Is there like a trick? Is there like a Kardashian pose so that you look really good on the zooms? And he was like, yeah, you just need to get over it. That's what it is. And I realized I do need to get over it. But when I look back to the interview that we did last year and the video of it, your presence is just I mean, you're just as bubbly, but like you've gone down a notch and it's just getting so comfortable with your own authenticity and being able to just roll with it exactly as who you are. Yeah. I think, you know, when we're doing something new, we don't necessarily know how to do it perfectly. Right. Obviously we don't. And so the way we approach it is like, well, what have I seen other people do? Like, let me try that. And so we're just going off of like learned experiences, but until you actually are in it, like you're in the arena, you're doing the work, then it's like, oh, now I'm finding a new familiar. Now I'm getting comfortable in my own skin. You know, I used to hate being in front of video. Like I had this deep down fear about video, which is why I've never really embraced it until now because I had to, because that's all we had. Right. (laughs) It took a pandemic for me to to embrace being on camera, but it's a wonderful feeling when you can just let that go and just show up as if you would, if you were around your friends and it does, it feels comfortable. And it just took a lot of experience, a lot of trying. I just did. I made, I've made almost 70 videos this year and we put them out every single week. And we just actually recorded some new ones yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I was like divinely inspired. It was like a lightning bolt just like struck me like minutes before I'm supposed to start talking in this video. And I'm just like, this is so good. And I'm feeling so alive because number one, I'm sharing the things that are most important to me. I'm sharing them in a way that feel 
unique to my own way of experiencing the world. And I'm happy to share that. Right. And just, it just keeps getting better and better and better. I used to like toil for hours over what am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? Now I just show up. Right. And I'm just who I am. And I speak to the needs of the audience the best that I can. And that's really how I approach it. So it feels more real. Mm -hmm. That's been a learning process for me too, that the solo episodes that I do are more popular than a lot of the other episodes, but it's very hard. It's very hard to sit down and record yourself, you know, talking just to yourself about yourself, about what you think into the ether and then have the balls to put it out there and think someone's going to want to listen to it. So it's hard to do. And I, I struggle to do it myself and, but I, I want to just keep going because I went to one of the first events I've been to last month and I'm going again, it's a real estate investor group for women. Only 20 women were there. And when I shared a little bit about my story, just, I could see the room. I could see the energy, like there's instant credibility. There's instant, like I've probably walked a day in your shoes. I'm going to guess or close to it and trust because how can I judge anybody coming from (laughs) what I've been through and what I've, and what I've done in my own life, all the mistakes that I've done and I continue to make in my life. So I'm just, I'm really proud of you and all it's all come together in a way that I couldn't have predicted. Yeah. I didn't predict it either. And I'm still not predicting it. Like, (laughs) Oh, I'll predict it now. I'll predict it now. I'm going to do it right now. So you've landed a couple of, I won't say their names. You've landed a keynote at a very large corporation. And you did that by just showing up and showing up and showing up. It was not a connection. It was not a cold call. It was none of that stuff. It was somebody finding you who was already a fan in the audience that you had built for eight years that they came to Mm -hmm. you and Mm -hmm. had seen your work that you'd done before was blown away, has asked you to do it for them. And I'm going to guess you're going to be able to rinse and repeat that over and over and you'll be well into six figures by the end of this year. Whoa. I hope so. Yep. That would be good. We'll do another follow-up and you'll buy lunch if that, if that happens. But I really do. I think your message is really powerful and I think everybody needs it and it's relevant. I know when we first met, it was like, how do we pitch you in a way that doesn't sound like I'm an artist and I'm here to talk about your feelings to a corporation. But once you decided that you actually were just going to focus on artists, you became laser clear. And then the message was so clear. It resonates with everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I love working with artists. I feel like, you know, you know, because I'm an artist, I love working with artists. We have that in common. I love seeing that transformation. I love seeing people create after they've worked with me and it's amazing. I can't say enough about my clients and how well that they do in my program. And so I'm just looking forward to, you know, working with more people and then just taking this message to organizations that need to hear about how, Um, The way that we live our lives every day, the emotional wellness, like the level that we're at with understanding our emotions and our thoughts, like how that impacts us at work and our ability to create anything new. And so this is what's like turning people's heads is because they never thought of this before. And I wouldn't have thought of it either, but I've been reading research study, research study, research study about creativity in the workplace. Like I've probably read like five 40 page research studies and you know, they're so dry. They're like, it's so boring, (laughs) but like, you know, I'm hungry for this. Right. So, and I'm taking notes and I've got my highlighter and I'm like, jotting down like the most important things. And I saw this one phrase leading for creative performance. And I thought, that's it. This is what I'm doing. And then I combine that with emotional wellness because in the research studies, very little research has been done on the impact of your emotional state and creativity. Now they have research positive and negative emotions, but that's as far as it's gone. And so that's why I have buckled down. I am conducting a new research study. I'm going to publish an academic paper. I am going to give this work way more credibility than it already has right now, not only for the community that I serve so that people acknowledge like the power of creativity, but also for myself, like this is my life's work and I want to get it published. I want to be recognized 
recognized for this because I want to speak on it. And I, and you just keep building that platform and then you step up on it and you build that next platform and you step up on it. And this is how it goes. Like no one's getting famous here fast, right? (laughs) We're just taking one small step at a time. And that is what I've always done. And I know that there's been many times I wanted to quit that it has seemed too hard. And, you know, I've gone so many years without making a whole lot of money and, Mm -hmm. you know, but with just my passion driving me and, but now like, because I stuck with it and I found a way to sell, like you said, if I knew how to sell like 10 years ago, I would be a different position than I am right Right. now. Like marketing and sales are different. Like I'm a marketer, I'm good at marketing, but I never knew anything about sales. And so I would be, I would make a great product. I would do great marketing, but then everything would stop right there. I never lead generated. I never did anything like that. And now I'm just like, Oh, that's like, that was my Achilles heel. But now that I'm learning it, it's like, okay, every artist out there, if you're watching this and you don't know anything about sales, or you think you know about sales, I just want to encourage you to go and learn some more because it has just opened up a whole new world of opportunity and possibility for me. So well, let's talk about that a little bit because because that kind of leads into the things that I was thinking. <laughs> so that's something that we talked about early on where I was like, sales and marketing are not the same at all. In fact, in my entire sales career, 25 years, I never once really had any marketing. If somebody wanted a brochure, I'd either make one up or I'd get one from someone. Like there was never, uh, you know, there was PowerPoint presentations and you know, but it was all about relationships and trust, et cetera. And that was how the sales were built. But also knowing the difference between your buyer and your customer, right? So you have a buyer now inside of a corporation and she looks like a certain person, you know, she looks in this box, but your, who you'll deliver it to may look totally different. They may never, that audience may never buy anything from you but a bunch of those buyers may buy something from you. So understanding the difference between a buyer and and an end user is what I would call them is really important because you need to sell to the buyer. And we often try to sell to the end user and that is not the purchaser. But you know what, talking on that, and I am going to go a little bit into a little shameless self-promotion here, because you know that through this year, there's only a few people that I work with one-on-one and do coaching because I struggle with all the things that everybody else says too. I'm like, I know I do this. And I know I do it well, but I really don't know what the package is. You know what I mean? So maybe you could talk a little bit about, because when, when I hear you now encourage other artists to learn about sales, I'm like, girl, I mean, you would never have said that a year ago. And it is the the scariest thing. People are always like, I don't want to do sales. I don't want to do sales. And I'm like, newsflash, everyone has to do sales and you're already in sales. You might as well be good at it and and do it in a way that makes you feel proud. Because I know that the way you do it now, you're like, of course you want to connect with me because I'm amazing. It's not cold calling into a company you don't know anything about. So maybe you could walk through that transformation for you. (laughs) Um, Well, I just think that when you believe in what you're selling, Mm -hmm. then sales doesn't feel so weird. So you have to have a really compelling offer. And, you know, for an artist, it's tough because you're selling something brand new every time. So like, that's a little bit difficult, but at the same time, your offer isn't necessarily your painting. It's like your energy. It's what like you're giving through your painting. And there's people who are going to be attracted to that. And so if you don't know what that is, then you're probably going to make a lot of buyers feel confused because they're not going to know who you are. Like, that's the thing. Oftentimes when we get into art, we haven't even discovered who we are yet. Right. Because we just know that we like to do this thing and it's fun. And yet that's why we're like, but my body of work isn't very consistent. It's like, well, that's because you haven't really found yourself through the process. And so that's a really important piece. And selling is so much easier now. Like, I think it's fun because I really believe in what I'm offering and I live it day in and day out. So it's easy to talk about. And so if you haven't gotten to that point with your work, then you have a lot to work on, right? Right. You need to embody this artist who you are like, freaking call yourself an artist, number one. That's what most people like have the hardest time doing. It's like this word that has so much weight when really it's just a description of someone who is inspired to create. Right. And so, yeah, you're an artist, you're making something new. Now, if you want to 
be better at sales, be better at knowing yourself, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be better at knowing your offer. You're like, well, I don't, what is my offer? It's this painting. No. What are you offering through this painting? Is it validation for someone else to say, oh, I see myself in that. I feel, I feel seen. Mm -hmm. Or is it something beautiful? You know, it's, you just never know what people are looking for, but you know who you are. And so you're going to attract in what people love will love about you. So that's why I like, I don't work with artists on sales or building their business. Like I don't do that because there's other people who do that out there really well. I'm not trying to recreate the wheel. But what I do really well is help people to find themselves, connect with, and discover their purpose and their passion and how to put that out in the world effortlessly. Right. I can work with them on their sales if they need to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you spoke at the creative group and you mm-hmm. were blowing minds because <laughs> they, I think we all think we have to sell like to this one person and to that one person. And then you were like, well, no, just like have one client and sell a bunch to them. And it's like, huh? right. Right. What? (laughs) Right. Or, you know, look at your model, right? If you have a $2,000 painting, how many $2,000 paintings do you have to sell in one month to survive? How many people have $2,000 to drop on a painting? That's not going to work. I'm so over selling paintings for $200. Exactly. Exactly. Uh -uh. That has never happened. I'm telling you in the future, like now, like I don't want to sell anything unless it's $5,000 and up. Right. Right. I only do commissions now as well in my painting world. And I, I started doing dogs kind of by mistake, not really planning to, and it's a little bit of a niche. And I found that the price just keeps going up and up and up because number one, the dog has to be cute. Okay. So let's just cover that. And then, and everybody thinks their dog is cute because I'm not like, anyway, the type of art that I do and the way it comes out, but I do keep it at a high level because it's a labor of love, et cetera. But I, you know, I only want to engage with people who really want to spend the money, Mm -hmm. but there was something that you said earlier, and it's something that I've talked about before. It's acting as if, and I think if anybody is listening, this is really important and you are an artist or a creative of some kind, or you are a part-time singer or whatever it is that you're keeping in your back pocket, not talking about, I encourage you to pull that all out and lead with it. So when I first started painting and realized that it set a part of me free, Mm. I still had a corporate job. Yes. I'd sold a few paintings like for 50 bucks. And I was like, okay, well then now, now I'm a professional. People paid me money. I'm a professional. I had cards made up that I was an artist And I started, I decided that for one year, every time someone asked me, what do you do? I was going to say, I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. And it was an incredible experience. So for one year, if I met someone at a cocktail party, what do you do, Jennifer? I'm an artist. What? Why are you here at this technology conference? (laughs) You know, there was so much interest in what I was doing, whether they understood art or they didn't. I don't have a formal art training at all. I've never been to art school, Mm -hmm. so I don't have any of that. But that exercise has helped me. It's helped me being an investor, being a podcaster, anything, just kind of leading with it and telling the truth. And then eventually I'd be like, oh, and I have a corporate job and that's how I make my money. But it really did instill in me a real comfort to this day that I, even though I'm not painting nearly as much as I used to, I still feel comfortable saying I'm an artist. It's absolutely part of who I am. Yeah. Same here. You know, I've been going on dates a lot and guys don't even know, like, how do you make money? It's like, well, you're not familiar with coaching and speaking industries and maybe not understand, you know, but like, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've wanted, always wanted to do. Like I'm living my dream professional life and Mm -hmm. all because like, I just kept believing that I could. Right. And I did, I did not give up and I did not stop. And you aren't going to. And I just kept going. I'm not going on. It's only going to get bigger, much, much bigger. We're going international. (laughs) I I will carry your bags. (laughs) Come on. Let's take it. Let's do a speaking event somewhere cool and we'll just go. Well, I have a solution for that. So let's absolutely do that. Let's go do a speaking (laughs) event. And I have some solutions for that. I definitely think we're a little bit off on a tangent, but I really do think that the creative part should be folded in. The the creative and emotional part really needs to be folded into everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we talked about even money culture, which I didn't ask you because I asked you in the other interview, but Mm -hmm. if we talked about money culture, even at work and you'd see 
you know, if you're only driven by money and why that is, et cetera, et cetera. But listen, I want to direct our audience about what you're doing in the future, where they can find you, what you want people to do when they're reaching out. I want you to follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram at Beth English. You can check out my website at bethenglish.com. And I want you to come be a part of the Nashville Creative Group community. I think that you would really enjoy it. It's for anyone who is a creative or culture enthusiast. You don't have to be a painter or a photographer or make any sort of art. You just have to appreciate it and enjoy seeing it because people are sharing their work all day, every day, and it's wonderful. And if you would like to work with me, then follow me on social media and send me a DM. I would love to direct you towards the work that I'm doing currently and how to connect in with me because to me, that's the best way is just let's start building a relationship. Right. And I think we're going to do more of these streaming live to Facebook, whether anybody watches them or not. And they'll be on my personal page and also on the Micro Empires community page. So I'd encourage anybody listening to go there and join on Facebook as well. Beth, as always, thank you so much. You're incredible as per usual. And I really appreciate your honesty and being willing to kind of walk through what you went through this year. A lot of people, you know, maintaining the facade is so important to so many people, myself included for many, many years. And so, you know, your honesty just, it just means a lot and it goes a really long way. So I thank you. That's all that I know. And if you saw me on Instagram, you'd think all I was doing was running around in my bathing suit (laughs) all year long. But let me tell you, I was also inside working on my computer most days, which is not as fun and exciting to share online. So (laughs) I hope you like that Instagram content because I don't live there anymore. So now it's like buckled down. I'm into the work. But I'm in this beautiful space, so I'm very happy. Yeah. And we're happy you're back in Nashville. We needed you. We're ready. We're ready for you to be back. All right, Beth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate all of you and your feedback. So please keep it coming. Keep the questions coming and the comments and the reviews. I so appreciate it. Of course, you can reach me at micro-empires.com. And now I've added a tab on the website called Ready to Invest. And that is a place you can go and you can fill out a form. And it simply is a form of where you are in your life right now, what investments you might be interested in, what level you might be interested in. There is no obligation. This is just an opportunity for you to give me your information and I'll add you to a list as I come up upon opportunities that I will be raising capital for myself. I will include you and you can take a look at that. And my goal is to have many opportunities, large and small, across a variety of different investments. So please fill that out. Understand there's no obligation, but it just gives me an opportunity to see you and find out more about you. Have a great day.